So I've been playing Deadly Premonition. You know, Deadly Premonition is one of those games that when someone brings it up, you tend to hear nothing but good things about it. Of course, with me being the asshole that I am, I never trust those people. But maybe just this once, the people in my glowing PC box may be right. I mean, cult followings are usually nothing more than that. You know, a cult. But I feel like this may be the rare exception where the blind mumblings of perfection may be right. Either that or I've already been brainwashed without my knowledge and I'm now a body snatched goo baby like the rest of you. I'm sure I'll get some kind of proper introduction to the shebang of fools at some point. I expect cake. But for now, I guess I'll just review this game for what it is. So what this game is, is a survival horror game with sandboxy elements. You'd think that that would be weird enough to make the game stand out on its own, but really it's the game's story and characters that make this game special to a lot of people. Anyway, the game's story centers around FBI agent Francis York Morgan. But everyone calls him York. Please, 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 please just call me York. It's what everyone else calls him. So York is on his way to the small rural town called Greenville to investigate a murder case. However, things immediately start going tits up, and it becomes very apparent that this isn't your average serial killer. I mean, there are these weird zombie looking monsters everywhere, strange red vines, and a bunch of other shit I can't really talk about because I'll end up spoiling things. And before York knows it, he finds himself hunting down the almost folkloric raincoat killer. Also, York has an imaginary friend called Zack, whom he talks to all the time, but Zack never talks back because it's really just a way for York to address the player. And there's also this dude in a wheelchair with a gas mask who doesn't speak at all but has his servant doing all the talking for him, and this old lady at the hotel with a needlessly long dinner table. And basically, the dialogue in this game is somewhere in between IGN's review of God Hand and fucking brilliant. Although mostly brilliant. I really find it fascinating how well a classic how done it murder mystery still works. I mean, shit's been done since forever, yet I often find that the most gripping stories still tend to be who done it. And even if it isn't, it's definitely the kind of game where you want to read up on all of the characters and stuff after you're done playing. Also, I often hear people compare the game's story to Twin Peaks. I've honestly never seen Twin Peaks, so I can't say if that's true or not. But if that comparison helps to create a better picture of what the game is like, I'll gladly pretend to know what I'm talking about. Anyway, one thing that really stood out to me apart from all of the stuff I just mentioned is the game's soundtrack. More often than not, I had this giant pervy smirk on my face when the game just goes all like... The game also has some pretty great sound effects. And I'm usually pretty particular about my sound effects. I mean, it uses those really cheesy stock horror movie sound effects like... I know it's stupid, and I'm not even sure if the game uses them ironically or not, but I find it hilarious either way. Audio-wise, it kinda reminds me of Killer7 more than anything, and really, I wouldn't have been surprised if the entire game was a Grasshopper production. Hell, it even has the painfully obvious low budget. I mean, quite frankly, the game looks like shit. But I like it. It kinda looks like a PS2 game, and as I've mentioned before, those make me very happy in pants. And funnily enough, it actually was supposed to be a PS2 game. It began development under the name Rainy Woods, and it was first shown at the Tokyo Game Show back in 2007. It really didn't look too dissimilar back then though. Well, apart from the obvious differences with York. But yeah, the game isn't exactly great looking. Despite me liking it, I can definitely understand some people being put off by this. However, the jerky movements and the questionable facial expressions do kinda add to the uncanny vibe the game carries. Like, I subscribe to the philosophy that horror works best when it's ugly. Kinda like the stop motion movements in The Evil Dead or the polygonal graphics in Silent Hill. It could leave room for your mind to fill in the blanks or it could just add to the overall sense of what the fuck. The latter is definitely what it did for me. That said, you can defend the game all you want over its charm, and I will do too, but it's hard to deny that the game runs like shit. You know, things like the frame rate being terrible and the audio spazzing out here and there. And I get that that probably has to do with the game's low budget, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't detract from the experience at all. 
even if it is just a smidge. Anyway, story-driven games, and especially those from Japan, tend to treat gameplay as a bit of an afterthought. And while it certainly isn't perfect here either, it's definitely a lot better than what I expected. First thing about the gameplay that really jumped out at me is the fact that Greenvale is a fully explorable open world. And while there is driving, it's a lot less like GTA and a bit more like Shenmue. You know, where all the characters have their own little daily routines and events only happen at certain times. Luckily, if you happen to show up late for something, you can simply try again the next day. So there really isn't any penalty for missing anything, which means that the game doesn't turn into an anxiety-driven rat race. Adding to that is the fact that the in-game time actually works like real time does. So you can easily spend hours playing the game doing nothing but side quests and not have to worry about the game's story. And if you don't care about any of that, you can always have a smoke to make time go by quickly. Something else that the game does, which is certainly different from other games like it, is the fact that York requires maintenance. When looking good and sporting a nice clean shave, you'll be rewarded with money. However, if York looks more like the guy down the street who sleeps by the bridge and always asks for money when you walk by and you kind of want to give it to him, but you know he's going to spend it on more drugs anyway, so in the end you'd probably be better off buying him some food rather than giving him money, but you really don't want to go through all that effort. I mean, I sure as hell wouldn't. So you just end up ignoring him and walking by like you just don't care. You get fined. In addition to that, you also have sleep and hunger bars to deal with. If York is hungry, he loses health. Sleeping recovers it, but if he's sleepy, he'll become hungrier. So you need to eat food and drink coffee to prevent him from getting hungry and sleepy. What I like about this is that it's very unintrusive. Much like the game's time, it doesn't really hinder you in any way. There's plenty of food and drinks scattered around, so it never really became a problem. I mean, when I first read about the game having these features, I was kind of worried that I'd be playing a survival horror Tamagotchi. Luckily, I never experienced York getting either hungry or sleepy, and I was able to play the game fine by only occasionally checking the menu to see how he was doing. Apart from all that though, the gameplay is fairly generic survival horror stuff. You know, solve some puzzles, shoot some things, find some keys, you get it. However, I do have one little problem with this. Every time you pick up an item, the game showcases it. This would have been fine if this was a game where you barely pick anything up. In fact, I love little things like this, it reminds me of Resident Evil. But in this game, you pick up tons of shit. And it can get a little annoying sometimes, especially because it shows it hanging around for a second of two every time. It really would have been nice if this was skippable. Or if it only happened with new items instead of every ammo pack you pick up. Also, the game is completely ridden with quick time events. Only this time I don't really mind them as much as I usually do. They're treated more like minigames rather than random pop-ups during cutscenes. And I'm still not a fan, but it definitely could have been worse. Anyway, the game also has this Silent Hill-like mechanic, where Greenville occasionally turns all weird and gory. As much as I didn't expect it, I actually found these sections to be pretty scary at times. I mean, these sections are pretty few and far between, so I never really got used to the game's creepy atmosphere. Now, these sections are kind of like a poor man's version of Resident Evil 4. So you find yourself slowly walking around, occasionally pushing a crate or two, but mostly just shooting things in the face. And despite the aiming being a bit flimsy, I did kind of like the shooting in this game. I mean, it's definitely not the best third-person shooting out there, but it's certainly not the worst either. Like, it felt a little awkward at first, but after a while I found that shooting things in the face with a shotgun is pretty fucking satisfying to do. That said, the game doesn't have any kind of difficulty settings at all, and the default is set on easy. Personally, I didn't really mind, but if it's a challenge you're looking for, you won't find it here. With all of its interesting mechanics being really unintrusive, its puzzles mostly consisting out of solving a riddle or two, and with all of its survival horror parts forgetting about the survival bit and showering you with ammo and health packs, there really isn't any kind of challenge here at all. For instance, the game's weapons have durability. Yet, by the time the game was over, I was still carrying the same iron pipe that I picked up right at the beginning. All of that said though, I did really like playing this game a lot. I mean, it has the same kind of charm that Capcom games had back in the late 90s and early 2000s. 
In any case, I can easily see this game becoming one of my favorite games of the past generation, and it'll definitely join Killer7 and Silent Hill 2 on the list of games that felt nostalgic to play through even though I didn't play them growing up. Also, the game's creator Swery totally follows me on Twitter, so I believe there is a conflict of interest. I'm sorry, please unsub.